Welcome, welcome. We're so excited to see you all here. I'm Doug Bailey. I'm the chair of the Volunteer Park Trust. And we and the Friends of Seattle's Olmsted Parks have worked together to bring this lecture to you. I want to express our appreciation to the Seattle Parks Foundation for being our fiscal agent and for helping us pull this all together. Um, we were going to have a short film, I think it's the 14-minute version, uh, of the Parks of Buffalo, and um, then we will introduce the speaker. And here is Jennifer Ott, who's the president of the Friends of Seattle's Olmsted Parks, who will give us a word about them. Hi there, um, I'm Jennifer Ott. I am the president of the Friends of Seattle's Olmsted Parks. And we're an organization that started in 1983 by several people in this room were involved in that. Um, as a way to promote awareness and enjoyment of Seattle's Olmsted legacy and to protect what we have, um, landscape preservation is a very difficult thing to parse your way through. And so we work very hard to um, protect what we have and to um, make sure people get to enjoy it. And to that end, we're thrilled to have Thomas here tonight um, as part of our um, effort to learn more about Olmsted's legacy. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Four Culture Program. They gave um, FSOP a grant this year from the, I'll get this right, the King County Lodging Tax Program. And it's made a huge difference in our um, ability to do programs like this. So thank you. <laughs> The city of Buffalo is the best planned city as to its streets, public places, and grounds in the United States, if not the world. Frederick Law Olmsted. In 1868, Frederick Law Olmsted was the most famous landscape architect in North America. With his partner, Calvert Vox, he had designed Central Park in Manhattan. and Prospect Park in Brooklyn, the two largest and most popular public parks in North America. Now, Olmsted and Vox were being courted by other cities interested in creating great public parks. One of the first to call was Buffalo, New York. After the Civil War, Buffalo was the center of America, the place where the Erie Canal ended, linking east and west. It was among the most productive and wealthy industrial cities in the nation. But it would soon be known for something entirely different, the first park system in America. Buffalo would change forever the way cities are planned and scenery preserved. Well, when Olmsted was invited to come in 1868, Buffalo was really a, a booming city. Its industry was flourishing, its transportation was flourishing. It was also the center of a growing agricultural region. It was a time to spend money on municipal improvement. Olmsted took a one-day tour of the city in August of 1868. He immediately saw that Buffalo needed a park, desperately. A comprehensive park scheme is desirable because the immediate environs of the town are not at all attractive. And escape from Buffalo to anything like rural quiet is difficult and disagreeable, if not impossible. But Olmsted also saw that the city had very good bones. The original city plan of Buffalo was laid out in 1804 by Joseph Ellicott, the surveyor who'd worked in Washington with Pierre L'Enfant. He took the idea of a radiating city plan. Olmsted thought this was a really brilliant idea. It was a very unusual plan for an American city. On the tour, Olmsted was taken to three sites local citizens thought suitable for Buffalo's version of Central Park. But within a week, Olmsted let Buffalo know that his plan would not be Central Park transplanted upstate. It would be something much more ambitious. 
he comes up with the idea that this city would be better served with three parks in different parts of town. Three unique sites, three unique designs. To the west, along the Niagara River, Olmsted and Vox created the front with a terrace for viewing the scenic Niagara. On the east side, they placed the parade with grounds for marching and for active sports. To the north, the park eventually known as Delaware would be a pastoral landscape, a country place within the city. But there was more to the plan. They linked three parks together with a new type of public space, the parkway. A parkway is a series of roads and walks adapted exclusively for pleasure travel, occupied by turf, trees, shrubs, and flowers. Thus, at not great distance from any point of the town, a pleasure ground will be suitable for a short stroll, a playground for children, an airing ground for invalids. The way itself would thus be more park-like than town-like. The ways were park-like, but they were also Parisian. The wide boulevards mirrored the grand streets of the city of Paris and brought a bit of French romance to upstate New York. Olmsted and Vaux uh, were very knowledgeable about Paris. The idea of having circles where the parkways come together in Buffalo was something taken from Paris. And the way the parkways link the city to the main park was also Paris. The main parkways are 200 feet wide, which is a very wide street, obviously, and they were lined with multiple rows of the American elm. The old pictures of the parkways lined with those trees are just spectacular. They're truly cathedrals of green. Buffalo accepted the Olmsted Vox plan, and in 1870, work began on what would be America's first park system. Olmsted and Vox are always thinking in comprehensive terms. So when they design a park, it's not just to be a pretty place or a place to play baseball. It's always connected to the rest of the city and the, the way the city functions. He saw this whole city as being a kind of organism of living, working, commerce, all connected by a very functioning system of movement. By 1874, the three parks were largely complete and a resounding success. Olmsted and Vox had ended their partnership two years earlier, but Olmsted continued to design parks for Buffalo. And his interest in the area extended beyond the city to the great natural wonder, Niagara Falls, 20 miles to the north. Olmsted had come to Niagara Falls even as a youngster, and he was very impressed, as many people were. And when he started to work here in Buffalo in the late 1860s, it renewed his interest in the falls. He was very upset by the fact that much of the land around the falls had been bought up in parcels by private individuals. The local property owners had lined the banks of the Niagara River with a shoddy mix of factories and tourist traps. For Olmsted, the buildings were defacing a landscape of sublime beauty not only the great waterfalls, but an entire waterscape. The illumined spray and mists and fleeting water, the water-worn rocks, the rare beauty of the old woods, the infinitely varied play of light and shadow, refractions and reflections, and much else that is indefinable. Olmsted had laid out a philosophy of scenic preservation before in a report about Yosemite Valley in California. Great natural scenery, he wrote, should be preserved from development and yet made available for everyone to see. He now brought this philosophy to bear on Niagara. Niagara Falls was really the first big national campaign on behalf of scenic preservation. Olmsted called it the Free Niagara Movement, and it could be in some ways seen as the beginnings of the National Park Movement. In 1879, Olmsted and the Free Niagara Movement submitted a report to the New York legislature calling for the state to buy the land and tear down the buildings that surrounded the falls. 
the state refused. So Olmsted began the first national public relations campaign for scenic preservation that had ever taken place in America. He used tactics that have now become familiar, public petitions, letters to the editor, and celebrity endorsements, including the writers Henry James and Thomas Carlyle, the painter Frederick Church, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, and the future president, Grover Cleveland. In 1885, Olmsted and his supporters won. New York State bought back the land along the river bank and the island in the river above the falls. The new state reservation would be designed, of course, by Frederick Olmsted, and he turned to his old partner, Calvert Vox, for help. To be sure, their plan of 1887 was never fully implemented, but the ideals were, that is, that it should be kept as a natural site, that it would be open primarily to pedestrians. What he wanted people to see there was mostly the beauty of the waterscape. The falls, of course, but he even thought the rapids were more impressive and compelling than the falls, and he wanted people to have easy viewing access. The gem of the Niagara Falls State Park is Goat Island, and to Olmsted and Vaux, that in fact was the most beautiful part. Areas of it are as they would have known it, especially the Three Sister Islands. You can walk out onto the third island the way Olmsted and Vox could have and see the rushing rapids coming on. If the mist is rising at the right angle, you don't see the casinos and the towers on the Canadian side, and for a, a brief period, you could, you could put yourself back in time. Olmsted would work in Buffalo for three decades. After his retirement, his sons carried on his business. He and his successors really had a great role in shaping the city of Buffalo. But over the years, parts of the Olmsted system were changed. Much of the front, the park along the river, became a traffic plaza. On the east side of Buffalo, bulldozers reduced the once elegant Humboldt Parkway to a commuter freeway. It was called Progress. But more recently, another kind of progress came to Buffalo, a grassroots community group that would become the Buffalo Olmsted Parks Conservancy was formed in 1978. The Conservancy now manages and protects all of the Olmsted Parks in Buffalo in a public-private partnership with the city. Well over a million people visit these parks each year. A park is a work of art designed to produce certain effects upon the mind of men. The purpose of parks is to provide a feeling of relief experienced by those entering it on escaping from the cramped, confined, and controlling circumstances of the streets and town. In other words, a sense of enlarged freedom is to all, and at all times, the most certain value and gratification afforded by a park. Frederick Law Olmsted. My name is Eliza Davidson. I've had the pleasure in recent years of um, serving with Thomas on the board of the National Association for Olmsted Parks. And um, the president of that organization is with us tonight, Christopher Bailey, here in the front row. And um, I was talking to Thomas at one of our board meetings, and he let me know that he really longed to visit Seattle and see our Olmsted legacy, which has quite a reputation. And um, so we hatched uh, an idea, and Friends of Seattle's Olmsted Parks and Volunteer Park Trust were quite interested in bringing him out here to talk to us about what um, a sometimes struggling city has been able to do to bring back to life and restore the beauty of uh, their Olmsted Park system, as you know from watching the movie, the very first in the U.S. 
Thomas is a native of Morelia, Mexico. He has a Spanish and business administration degree from University of Michigan, followed by a degree, a master's, in landscape architecture and regional planning. And uh, with that wonderful combination of skills, he's very well suited to running a conservancy that is charged with um, running and raising funds for and administering the whole Olmsted Park system in Buffalo. And I would like to have you all join me in welcoming Thomas to Seattle. Well, it is such a delight to be here, and I've had an incredible visit so far, uh, getting to see all of these wonderful parks and parkways throughout the city, and, uh, and see some of those places that I've been so excited about for so many years. Certainly the Washington Park Arboretum and the Japanese Garden were highlights. Uh, Seward Park out in the lake. I mean, just so many. I was uh, whining in the car that we weren't gonna stop and walk. <laughs> And, and uh, so Eliza took pity on me and we got out and walked on these wonderful woodland parks. And it is uh, a pretty amazing place. And I've known that for a long time, but this is my first uh, actual visit here. So I mean, just couldn't be more pleased. I wanna thank tonight's event sponsors. I'm probably forgetting a few. Please forgive me if I didn't capture everybody, but uh, I know that the, the um, these folks have all worked pretty hard to get you all here tonight, and I'm very grateful that you've come and that they uh, are hosting this event. Um, let's just dig in. Uh, Buffalo Buffalo's a, has been a struggling city for a long time. It's no surprise, right? Um, for really over four decades, Buffalo's been better known as a, sort of a Rust Belt ruin, and uh, it lost its entire industrial job base uh, almost uh, in the 80s was really when all the steel plant jobs disappeared, 40,000 jobs in two years. Um, it's, it also lost half of its population. And so you would expect Buffalo to be a place that has no hope, certainly no green infrastructure, and yet it's a place today that in the last few years has been filled up with hope and energy and new jobs have been coming into town. There's a new sense of optimism about this city. And the Conservancy has been a part of that. And I'm, I'm, I think that there's some lessons there that can be learned and shared with others. Um, there's been just sort of this dramatic boost in our self-image as a city. And uh, really at the core of this transformation, let me see if I can get this right. <clears throat> has been a uniquely successful public-private partnership between the City of Buffalo and the Buffalo Homestead Parks Conservancy. Uh, the Conservancy has been charged with the day-to-day -day maintenance, the operations, restoration, and promotion of the entire historic Homestead Park system um, for a decade, actually almost to the day. And uh, we've been able to transform these just severely neglected landscapes and streetscapes into what was recently described by Adrian Benepe, the former commissioner of parks for New York City, as the best maintained park system in the nation. So, so many similarities between Buffalo and Seattle. In 1903, uh, Seattle was just this booming place with lots of money and lots of spit and vinegar. Well, in 1868, as you saw in the movie, Buffalo was the same way. Lots of energy, lots of sort of ambition for the future. And uh, so um, wanting to hire the best of the best, they hired the Olmsted firm, just like here in Seattle. And um, the city leaders were familiar with New York, and so they uh, wanted to have their version of Central Park. And uh, this whole idea of um, creating a park system emerged from Olmsted's visit very new concept at the time. I mean, this was a time when there was no parks in most American cities, very, very, very few parks at all, and certainly not park systems. And uh, the idea of connecting these parks together 
uh, using boulevards and shady avenues and park ways, an idea that Calvert Vox and Olmsted invented, uh, was completely new. And it was embraced just like it was here uh, by the folks in Buffalo and creating this idea of a city within a park. Uh, the city really agreed to take on this idea and they uh, invested an astonishing amount of money. At the time, a million dollars were set aside to build this park system. I haven't done the math on what that would be in today's dollars, but suffice it to say, it would be quite a lot of money. Uh, the uh, Buffalo Parks Commission was formed in 1868. It was run by volunteers, unpaid volunteers, who uh, their very first official act was to hire the Olmsted firm. Um, because that relationship lasted for so many decades, uh, we were able to enjoy the design work of almost every version of the Olmsted firm. So we had the Olmsted and Vox, and then just Olmsted, and then the Olmsted and Sons, and then just Olmsted Brothers. And so there's uh, Buffalo is a, a sort of an outdoor museum of uh, the Olmsted design legacy. Their last project was completed in Buffalo in 1868, just three years after Olmsted's retirement. Our Buffalo park system, it boasts Olmsted's very first waterfront park. Front par uh, waterfront park, it's, it was mentioned, front park was right on this bluff overlooking the confluence of Lake Erie where it flows into the Niagara River. Um, these magnificent boulevards were designed to really enhance the park arrival experience. And Olmsted originally called them park um, arrival or entrance roads as opposed to park ways, which was an idea or a, a term that he came up with a little bit later. And uh, they're actually in Buffalo, exactly five feet wider than the Champs Elysees. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> our anchor park is Delaware Park. It's the largest uh, one in the system, and it boasts really a magnificent meadow and um, woodlands, mature trees, and a very scenic lake. And uh, Martin Luther King Park, which was originally called the Parade, was uh, first designed by Frederick Lawmstead Sr., and then three decades later was redesigned and completely changed by John Charles Olmsted, who, of course, most of you are familiar with John Charles's work here in Seattle. So we're very, as far as we know, it's the only park where Olmsted Sr. designed it, and then the uh, juniors redesigned Dad's Park completely. Um, he created this very formal design with very large water features, uh, the five-acre wading pool, and then an enormous uh, lily pond, and then a, a magnificent fountain. Um, the, I'll talk a little bit more later about the re restoration work that's been done in this park, but suffice it to say, it's been quite an ordeal. <laughs> Olmsted's plan, the original plan for the first three parks and parkways was completed largely by uh, the 1870s. Then they kind of ran out of money, ran out of steam, and just worked on landscaping and enhancing what they had. By the 1880s, 1885, uh, the folks in South Buffalo were starting to complain that they didn't have parks and parkways. And so the Olmsteads returned to Buffalo in 1888 and designed a second phase of parks and parkways for the city. And um, they're um, just sort of an aside. Just a few blocks from these parks and parkways is where those 40,000 jobs dried up in the 80s. And yet this neighborhood is still rock solid. And I believe that the reason that this neighborhood has not only survived but thrived is because it had this amazing visual character and quality of life afforded by the Olmsted streetscapes and, uh, and park system. If, if uh, that sort of green infrastructure and amenities had not been there, I believe that we would be looking more like Detroit. I don't mean that unkindly, by the way. And then things got not so great. It was, um, the parks really flourished well into the 20th century. And uh, 
But in 1957, uh, something happened that really started the, the spiral of decline for Buffalo. The Welland Canal. Anyone heard of the Welland Canal before? I got a couple people from Western New York who have. Thank you very much. So the Welland Canal opens up in southern Ontario and it diverts all of the shipping away from Buffalo onto the St. Lawrence Seaway. And all of the, um, that whole uh, transshipment business, the grain elevators and so on, uh, were abandoned. And they just are sort of still there uh, and testaments to this sort of, uh, I guess, uh, lost economic engine. Then uh, the other thing that really uh, took a toll on the park system was the construction of urban highway infrastructure. And uh, it was just really devastating on the parks and parkways. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, it cut off the parks from the waterfront. And um, really, I think the destruction of the Humboldt Parkway is uh, one of the losses of, in the, um, of the Olmsted system in Buffalo that is most bemoaned by Buffalonians. Those that remember it just can't believe that it was lost. Um, it's, we're working hard to try and get pieces of it back, but it really devastated the east side of Buffalo because it created this division. This, uh, it, it destroyed that visual amenity, that green space amenity, and the quality of life that down in South Buffalo served so well to preserve the community was torn out of the heart of the east side and, uh, and it has had devastating consequences on property values and quality of life ever since. This is uh, what it looks like today. Isn't that awful? <laughs> we can thank Robert Moses for that particular scar. Yeah, I'm not a fan. So uh, in the 1980s or... Um, other sort of buildings were added into the landscapes that were uh, not uh, contributing to the historic character of the parks. And that really the day-to-day -day care of the park systems obviously just went down the tubes. Uh, the city planner just found this photo of this car from Delaware Park. Apparently it wasn't out there just for a day or two, it was out there for years, moldering. I know, it's, it, today it's impossible to imagine. Just across from this is where Chris and uh, Liza might remember that's where we planted the beautiful weeping beech tree in honor of NAOP's board meeting in Buffalo. So that, that was right there. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Um, the parks really became a place that were known for being dangerous, uh, for graffiti, for they were overgrown and weedy and full of trash and just scary places that nobody wanted to go to. Um, I was having breakfast with one of our uh, wealthy sponsors and I said, what is your most memorable experience in the parks? And he says, oh, probably the day I got mugged at knife point. I said, oh, geez. Those were the bad, very bad old days. And I think the nadir of the, this era was when the parks commissioner was thrown in jail for dumping chemicals into the park lake. <laughs> hmm. But in 1978, a uh, very spirited group of volunteers came together to form the Buffalo Friends of the Olmsted Parks. Uh, I will mention that one year later, the same spirited group gathered together people from all over the country, including, um, where's Doug? Uh, Donald, Harris. Donald Harris, yeah, Don, is, uh, to, uh, who's here this evening to form the uh, National Association for Olmsted Parks. So uh, this is quite the uh, plucky group, um, to say the least. They're still after good things in Buffalo. Uh, what really uh, roused them was there was a proposal to build a science magnet school in the Martin Luther King Park next to the Buffalo Museum of Science. And uh, they basically said that this um, should not happen, that this uh, green space, this uh, Olmsted legacy should be preserved for future generations. And they fought it all the way to the New York State Supreme Court and lost. The building is there. But the battle really galvanized them. It taught them how to, um, how to raise money and uh, how to work together to make sure that this never happened again. 
Now, at the time, one of their top goals was to get people back into the parks. And so they um, signed an MOU with the city and uh, started raising a little bit of money for uh, events and programming, uh, yoga in the parks. And uh, they had a pumpkin float and you know, just trying to do anything they could to try and raise awareness and, and appreciation for these parks again. Uh, they did some modest capital improvements. Um, but then in 2004, um, the, uh, the city was really literally on the, on the brink of bankruptcy and they were looking for ways to offload responsibilities and this plucky little group said, we'll take care of the parks. Uh, and so in partnership with the County of Erie, which was in better financial shape than the city, they agreed to maintain and care for the entire uh, Olmsted Park system. And this began uh, a really uniquely successful uh, public-private partnership. Uh, the initial agreement was renegotiated in 2010 with the county releasing itself from the partnership uh, because the city was getting more money and the county was going down the tubes. Uh, so they, uh, this agreement uh, for another 10 years uh, has allowed the Conservancy to really uh, just completely transform these historic landscapes. Um, the Conservancy began a long-range planning uh, effort with, with the city, with all the stakeholders. Um, we were, it was led by the New York State University's uh, uh, urban design project at the University at Buffalo. And uh, they also worked with the Center for Computational Research at uh, University of Buffalo to create a digital terrain model of the entire park system. And um, that's probably the only thing that we have that Central Park Conservancy doesn't have that they wish they did. So, um, a very well-known landscape architect from Cornell, uh, Peter Trowbridge, worked on the project along with an engineering firm, a local engineering firm, one of whose uh, landscape architects was a founding member of the Buffalo Friends of the Olmsted Parks. And uh, this really resulted in a, a planning process that had broad input from key stakeholders, from the community. There was just an enormous amount of effort to reach out to the community, which had a couple of, of uh, effects. One was it gathered uh, input, which is critical, but also it raised awareness. It made people more aware that of, the, uh, of the resource and the special nature of this park system. So the result of this five year planning effort, yes, five years and a lot of money, um, was really the, the plan for the 21st century. And we were just sort of finishing it up when I was hired uh, and they were originally calling it the 20 year plan. And I said, well, how about if we call it the plan for the 21st century and give ourselves a little bit more time? <laughs> so, it's very ambitious. It's uh, 300 projects have been identified and uh, it includes uh, not only projects within the historic footprint of the Olmsted Parks and Parkways, but also um, some potential extensions that were either proposed by Olmsted uh, but never built or that were built and lost uh, to create sort of the, the final intent that Olmsted had for the, for the city. And it also uh, defines a better connection with the Niagara River Greenway and it's a system of trails and parks along the Niagara River connecting Lake Ontario and Lake Erie all along the Niagara River and also connecting those two wonderful Olmsted landscapes, Niagara Falls uh, State Park and the Buffalo uh, Park System. Um, there is dedicated funding to implement this greenway uh, through mitigation funds from the relicensing of the hydroelectric plant on the Niagara River. It's uh, $100 million have been dedicated to this project over the next 50 years. Um, so the Conservancy has been able to begin some really significant restoration projects uh, in Front Park and Riverside Park, which are both fronting Niagara River initially. And we've improved facilities, new trails, uh, restored landscapes in the first phase of impl implementation of this Greenway Connection Plan. Once it's completed, the Greenway will have 36 uh, miles of trails and paths along the Niagara River, which will com connect to the 86 miles of paths and trails in the Olmsted system. So together, it makes just this really remarkable recreational amenity in western New York. 
So over the course of the past few years, the Conservancy has worked uh, very closely with the City of Buffalo to implement a lot of these uh, capital projects that are identified in the plan for the 21st century, but we've also been addressing 50 years of disinvestment and neglect. Um, the city has allocated almost $20 million of capital improvement projects in the Olmsted system uh, since 2006 when this mayor was elected. Uh, mayor Byron W. Brown, in case anybody wants to know, has, has done really great things for the park system in Buffalo. Be sure to let him know I told you that. <laughs> uh, the Conservancy has, con uh, has uh, been able to secure another $10 million in funding over the past decade. And what we try to do, there's so much to do. You have to create some priorities. There, there's so many projects, 300 projects. There's a lot of projects. And so what we did is we came up with, our, we have a long-range planning committee that works at uh, peopled by uh, board members of the Conservancy along with outside experts. And uh, we're always looking for ways that we can improve the park visitor experience. And so in order to do that, we made sure that we uh, adhere to certain goals in every project. Now, every project we do has to have at least a couple, if not all, of these goals addressed. And it comes up with a pretty nice acronym, doesn't it? Uh, the first time we came up with this acronym, we had a, the order around and it start, we, we said it was the SCARES. Um, <laughs> and we thought, no, that doesn't sound too good. So CARES, uh, comfort. And if you're thinking about sort of Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs, CARES is making sure that every park visitor has restrooms, drinking fountains, benches, those sorts of things. Um, recreation is a big part of what happens in the park system today certainly was not a big part of what Olmsted envisioned for the system initially in Buffalo in 1868. They didn't play baseball, they didn't play football, they didn't play rugby, they didn't, all these things that we use the parks for today were not part of Olmsted's vision. It was a place to go and have refreshment through being in nature. So it was really uh, what we would call the passive enjoyment of nature as opposed to the active recreation that so many of us enjoy today. Um, by the time his sons were active in the business, that had changed. And their parks started to have, and your parks, started to have more of these active recreation elements included in them. Although, I have to say, a lot of the parks that I visited have enormous amounts of natural areas and woodlands, and that's still that same uh, enjoyment of nature, opportunities for the enjoyment of nature. Uh, the environment, of course, critically important to everything that we do. And so when we think about projects, we always look for ways to, um, to address uh, stormwater runoff, to use more uh, native species, to try and uh, reduce waste, reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, that, that's all part of the considerations that we take into account for every one of our projects. And then uh, safety is critical. Uh, you know, we just don't want board members or anyone else being assaulted at knife point or any other way. <laughs> and uh, so we try to design projects in such a way that the parks become more safe. Although the number one way to make parks more safe is to have more people enjoying them. And that certainly has happened in Buffalo. So uh, the cute girl who's celebrating the... the um, Splash pad at MLK Park is my daughter, Sophia. She says hello. <laughs> She's a bit older than that now. Um, this is the, that massive uh, five-acre wading pool project, the Humboldt Basin in MLK Park. And I just put this up as an example of a recent project that we worked on in partnership with the city. The city allocated $3.8 million to this project, and we allocated half a million to it. Um, and uh, what it allowed, the city's money did all of the basic infrastructure, the concrete, and then we were able to come in and do the finishing touches that made the project so much nicer. And uh, we also were able to secure a $1 million commitment from our local Blue Cross Blue Shield to uh, have staffing at this project over the next 10 years. 
And without that staff support and supervision, this would become the, probably the greatest attractive nuisance in Western New York, <laughs> and, <laughs> instead of this wonderful recreational amenity. So in the summertime, it's a splash pad, the largest splash pad in, I don't know, the world, the universe. It's five acres, it's huge. And uh, then in the fall, we flood it, and it's a reflective pool, and then have ice skating in the wintertime, weather permitting. <laughs> We had a lot of ice skating last winter. It was very cold. And, uh, and then in the spring, it's again a, a reflective pool. And it's just stunning to see that what it was broken up, concrete, full of weeds. It was just as awful as it could be. And now to see it being utilized for a recreational amenity and programmed properly and always clean, always safe. It's really quite an amazing transformation in really the most uh, economically depressed neighborhood in our community. Uh, so a lot has happened in this, in this uh, park and continues to happen. The, the building that you see behind Sophia, uh, we call it a casino. I don't know, what do you call your park buildings? Park buildings? Yeah. For some reason in Buffalo, we call our park buildings casinos, and there's no gambling that goes on in them, so I don't know. But anyway, uh, the, the city is investing $600,000 to restore the exterior, and the cons Conservancy is investing $600,000 to restore the interior of the building. So it's just another example of how together we're making pretty incredible things happen and um, faster and better. Uh, we have a preservation architect on staff who is really, I call him the owner's representative at these projects even though the city is the owner. Um, but this is a way to make sure that the, the projects are done in a way that preserves and enhances these, the historic integrity of these projects. And I love the city, they're wonderful partners, but the, sometimes subtlety is not their, their strength. And there's a lot of subtlety involved in these projects. Um, so this, this park has come a long ways since uh, the 80s. Um, it was uh, the most neglected, the most uh, deforested park in the entire park system. And uh, recently, working with the city, we restored this really funky uh, bathroom shelter building with the witch's hat roof. It's now completely handicapped accessible and really quite lovely. And uh, we use it, there's a, a parlor with a fireplace that we use for meetings and community gatherings and then it has a very nice uh, men's and women's room. And it's part of our uh, greenhouse complex. You can just see the greenhouse behind on the lower uh, right hand side uh, where we propagate 18,000 annuals and perennials every year. And uh, we've been uh, transitioning from mostly annuals to more and more native flowering perennials. And uh, we're doing it slowly over time so that nobody has a heart attack when they don't see their favorite annuals out there. But little by little, we're just kind of easing away from the use of annuals that way. Riverside Park was uh, the last park uh, designed by the Olmsteads in Buffalo. And uh, we just celebrated the restoration of an Olmsted landscape there called the Minnow Pools. And, uh, it has curving walking paths and a dry riverbed, which interprets the original water feature, a stone arched bridge, benches, and literally thousands of plants, all uh, as close as we could possibly get them to the original plant palette designed by the Olmsted brothers. Interesting thing is that the original plans by Olmsted Sr. and Calvert Vox had no planting plans. They would hire um, very uh, skilled plantsmen, horticulturists, often Scotsmen, and, uh, and plant them in the park system, and then they would propagate plants and put them based on Olmsted's instructions and de design philosophy. By the time Olmsted's sons came along, they had developed a planting design, planting plans with plant lists, and, but they still didn't show individual plants and like little dots on the plans. They had just areas that they would call out in specific plants. Um, and so we, when we're looking at our planting plans, there's still a bit of interpretation in, involved in uh, trying to recreate the plans and the, the gardens and plantings as close as we possibly can to uh, the original Olmsted. Uh, this project cost $1 million, which in Buffalo these days is still a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, it's completely transformed this entire end of the park. It, it, it had lost all its Olmsted and it was just soggy grass and pretty much unusable. 
and now it's just this wonderful, uh, heavily landscaped uh, garden space, and we're um, looking forward to seeing it grow in. It's going to take a few years for it to kind of get, uh, get established, but uh, it's already changing the way that people perceive this neighborhood. This is our most dangerous neighborhood. There's a lot of not good stuff happening in the neighborhood, and yet, in front of the, this park, recently an attorney who lived in a very ritzy part of town called Elmwood Village sold his house and bought a house on this park. Um, it's, uh, I think, a great sign that their folks are starting to perceive the value of their homestead landscapes this way. Uh, the Conservancy has been really trying to go green for the last few years and uh, we're really environmental projects uh, include planting over 4,000 trees throughout the park system. Uh, at their peak, the parks had 42,000 trees back in the 50s. Uh, we're down to 15, or I guess we're up, we've gotten up to 18,000 uh, in the last few years. So we still have a very long ways to go. But we plant all of our trees with the assistance of uh, volunteers, and we have about a 96% survival rate. And it's because of the way that we manage our landscapes, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, each year, over 2,000 volunteers uh, support the work of the Conservancy. And um, they help us with all kinds of things, like um, office administration and planning events and fundraising, weeding, watering, and, uh, and planting. Uh, they also help us with big water clean, uh, water's edge cleanups in partnership with the Riverkeeper uh, organization, which is dedicated to cleaning our waterways in western New York. Um, we've been working towards better management of invasive species, and I understand that's something that you work on aggressively in your woodlands as well. Um, it's, boy, it's easier said than done. <laughs> But uh, we have a great forestry team of professional arbor arborists who work out with volunteers uh, to try and uh, control the, uh, the advance of invasive species throughout the woodlands. And we're trying to um, develop self-sustaining um, woodland areas. Uh, we also have uh, been developing what we call managed meadow areas, which uh, reduce the amount of turf throughout the park system. Our goal is to eventually reduce mowed turf to by about 20% throughout the park system. I estimate that we mow about 800 acres. And uh, so over time, the impact, both, both visual, but also in terms of improvement to the uh, and slowing down stormwater runoff and uh, bio, adding biodiversity. And I believe adding visual quality to the park experience will be improved. Um, we are striving to be the greenest park system in America. So, and I, I challenge you. <laughs> Let's see who can get there first. Uh, we've uh, we've uh, bought our own compost tea brewer now. It's a 200 gallon compost tea brewer. And uh, we recently launched a pretty uh, extensive com uh, recycling partnership with the city of Buffalo. So, the way that we manage our 1,200 acres of parkland was adopted from, um, or adapted from the Central Park Conservancy's model. Um, we've actually had them come up and work with us, train us on how to use their model in Buffalo. It's a lot harder to manage 1,200 acres that are spread out throughout an entire city park, or city like you have here. Central Park is one concentrated, very heavily used park in the center of Manhattan, whereas ours is, and yours are parks that are spread out and connected with these streetscapes. Um, but we've identified 56 zones throughout the park system. Each zone is uh, overseen and managed by a zone gardener who um, takes care of that. Uh, it gives them tremendous accountability for what happens in their uh, part of the park, but also we we know who to talk to if things aren't right and also the visitors know them as well and they they become accustomed part of the landscape and um, We believe that that en enhances safety uh, There are ambassadors to the public and uh, the public in general really is very quite fond of them uh, we have uh, a superintendent of parks who oversees all of the work of the zone gardeners 
And our staff is really remarkably diverse. Uh, about 30% of our staff comes from minority background. Uh, they come from Burma. Our two lovely ladies here are from Burma. Uh, we have African American and Hispanic, uh, Puerto Rican, Mexican, Costa Rican, uh, and Dominican, from many, many parts of the world. We also have quite a few people from Africa, uh, West and East Africa. Um, Buffalo is a place of incredible diversity. Uh, people have coming, are coming from all over the world to settle in Buffalo. And the, the workforce in the park system reflects that diversity to the greatest degree possible. Um, one of the ways that we achieve that is that we work with the county's social services department. They have a program called Workfare. If you are receiving benefits through the welfare system and are able-bodied, you have to work. And so they assign about three or four hundred people a year to work for us. And from them, we're able to um, hire about 10 percent. And we train them in uh, horticulture and landscape practices. And, uh, and then some of those, about 10 percent of them, become permanent employees. And so we're, we're really, I'm very proud of the diversity of our workforce. I think it's uh, in Buffalo uh, the most diverse cultural institution. So. Uh, let's see. I want to get back on track here. <laughs> we, we also have a planning, design, and advocacy team. Uh, they're comprised of landscape architects and architects who work on long-range plans. Um, things like uh, trying to get a highway out of the middle of one of our parks. Uh, that's <laughs> sound familiar? <laughs> and uh, we consult regularly with our friends at the National Association for Homestead Parks in order to gather their wisdom on how they've tackled that. Um, the folks down in Atlanta who bravely fought off a proposal to build the Jimmy Carter Highway through the middle of a beautiful Olmsted Linear Park, successfully, I might add. So, um, the, uh, the Conservancy really has been working hard and successfully in, in many ways to um, move the city away from highways through parks back towards uh, restoring the original Olmsted legacy. And one of the most surprising things for me is that within the next um, 18 to 24 months, a uh, major access road to uh, the, an international bridge crossing that goes through Front Park will be eliminated and the Olmsted Park restored. So, yeah, but <laughs> that's a great thing. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to tell my board you guys applauded for that. That's great. <laughs> so, now, of course, all of this costs money, right? This is not free um, by any chance. And um, each year, the Conservancy receives $1.2 million uh, in cash, from a cash stipend from the city. We have a contractual relationship with them to take care of the parks. And then they also provide another half million dollars a year in in-kind support. So they pay the utilities and they pay uh, repairs on equipment and the use of some equipment, for which we are very grateful. But that does leave us still with about $2 million a year that we have to find somewhere. We get a half a million from earned income. So we run a few golf courses that are in the parks. We rent, have some facilities we rent out for weddings and so on. And uh, we've been really focused on improving the, our earned income sources of money because that's great money to have. It doesn't have strings attached and allows us to control our destiny a little bit better. Also, the entrepreneur in me really enjoys that. Um, and we've been very successful the, in getting the city to invest capital dollars in projects that then improves our uh, earned income flow. And it's a lot easier to get money from our city partners to do capital improvements than it is to get them to part with annual operating funds, for sure. Uh, so we have a, a board of trustees with 27 members. Um, we have a committee that's dedicated to what we call institutional advancement. Other people call it philanthropy or development, or, but it basically means professional beggar. <laughs> so we have our professional beggar on staff. She's wonderful, love her to pieces. She told me I need to, she sent me an email today saying I have to handwrite postcards from Seattle to all our major sponsors of the gala that we had on Friday night. So, yeah, I'll do that tomorrow night. <laughs> And uh, we also uh, enjoy the services of a professional CFO. She's a, a CPA who's got a lot of experience in public accounting 
And so our board has a lot of assurances and our donors that the money is being spent as it's supposed to be, uh, as it's allocated in the annual budget. And, uh, and she's always, always looking at ways to improve our um, cash management, to reduce any opportunities for theft. Uh, if anyone has been involved in running a cash business like a golf course, you know that there's always that risk, right, of one for you, one for me. So we, we are always sort of looking for ways to mitigate that. Um, and she's really great at doing that. And uh, of course, there's a finance committee, an audit committee, all these committees of a very hardworking board that makes sure that this little budget that we have gets stretched as far as we possibly can. So looking back over the past decade, it's sort of easy to, for us to see the profound impact that our work has had on the city of Buffalo, just in terms of its visual character and its quality of life. And if you think about it, this is a city where every neighborhood, every major cultural institution, almost every major educational institution, public and private, are in or along one of the Olmstead landscapes or streetscapes. So as we are successful in taking care of these landscapes and streetscapes, the entire city begins to look and feel better, more attractive, certainly uh, more like a place that a cultural tourist might want to come and spend some time. And so recently Buffalo has been very excited about cultural tourism. And they've gotten very excited about our, our horticultural heritage and the, the insane gardening that goes on in Buffalo in the three minutes that we have every summer to garden. <laughs> uh, back, I mentioned that one of the primary goals of the Buffalo Friends of the Olmstead Parks was to get people back in the parks. Well, I can safely say that we have surpassed that goal in every way possible. And uh, the parks are really, um, I think, suffering from overuse and abundance of use uh, to the point where they're being loved to death in some cases. And each year we host over 1,600 organized athletic events. We have 160 major public events in the parks. Um, it's, it's a little overwhelming, to be honest. Millions of visitors come into the parks to walk or to stroll or to jog or to run or to skate or to bike, golf, play basketball, rugby, croquet, soccer, football, or just enjoy a picnic and watch and be, enjoy Shakespeare in the park. So we have festivals like our Music is Art Festival, major, major festival that uh, uh, we have in Delaware Park the Irish Festival in Casanova Park, the International Friendship Festival at Riverside Park, the Italian Festival in South Park, live jazz in MLK Parks, Pine Grove Reunion. I mean, every single major charity walk, run, jog happens in one of our landscapes. They are extremely busy places. And uh, I know that your parks are as well. I mean, I was in Highland Park, it's, it, it, Volunteer Park, excuse me, Highland Parks in Rochester, I was there last week. Um, they're just such busy places, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with they're just, they're beautiful. They're places that are just beautiful, and there's an important role for beauty in our lives. And that's something that, under, that Olmsted and his sons understood very well, and translated very well into uh, places where people could be rest, rested or, re or have re recreation and recreate themselves. Okay, so there's certainly some challenges involved in all of this, right? Um, in addition to all of the, addition, the, the more resources that we have to get to restore the parks from the wear and tear of all this increased use, um, there's just um, so much to do. I mean, we're facing this perennial challenge to raise more money for operations. But I think that um, make sure I don't forget something really important here that I wanted to tell you. <laughs> there's, there's really a growing awareness in Buffalo about um, the Olmsted Parks and the parkways and that this is something very special. I'd say we still have a long ways to go in terms of helping them understand that um, their taxpayer dollars don't pay for everything and that it's only really a small portion of the budget that comes from the, the taxpayer coffers and that the rest of it comes from philanthropic dollars. 
So that's a big challenge that we have. I mean, some people are aware that, um, that we're involved and, and they think we're doing a great job. Everyone who knows that I run the Conservancy says, you're doing a great job. But it's that um, I think there's, there's still a big gap between the people that are aware of the, the good job we're doing and the fact that we can't do it without their help. So we recently uh, expanded and professionalized our fundraising staff. Uh, we've developed a better and stronger brand uh, that we use for our publications. And uh, we are really trying to increase the financial strength of the organization through inc increased giving, both from private individuals and also corporations. And uh, one of our goals is to build endowments for each one of the, our zones so initially, small endowment, 100,000 a zone, generates 5,000 a year, allows me to make sure I've got at least a seasonal zone gardener out there every year. And uh, that's one of my uh, goals before I retire, is to make sure I've got that in place. Um, we've got also a ways to go in terms of just interpreting the Olmstead legacy in Buffalo and, and telling our visitors, through the visitor experience, about this special asset and why you know having the first park system in in the united states is something special and um, telling our story is something that we're still working on i think you guys have done a wonderful job with the water tower and the exhibits that you have there um, online resources a lot of people these days learn uh, inf get information from their cell phones or from qr codes i mean there's all kinds of ways to tell the story that we're still working on and uh, we've hired a professional marketing uh, person for our staff to help us with our communications and make sure that we're telling the story in ways that are compelling. Uh, I certainly invite you to come and visit us in Buffalo. Uh, enjoy our Olmstead parks and parkways. Uh, I think they'll feel familiar to you in some ways. So sort of the curving paths and drives and the woodlands, the meadows and the water features. Um, Seattle and Buffalo have this in common. Uh, we're both Olmstead cities, and we have this green infrastructure that's enhanced our cities for all these years and uh, added value for with over a century. But like all special landscapes, are, they're ephemeral. They'll only persist in the urban core if they're constantly sustained through care, advocacy, Certainly, the, the private sector of this partnership has to come to the table and work with the public sector uh, in order to make sure that this legacy is something that we can pass on to future generations. It's, it's um, something that is so valuable, and yet it's a little bit intangible, isn't it? It's something that, what is, how do you define beauty? Well, everyone defines beauty in their own way. But I believe that the Olmsteads certainly had a vision of naturalistic beauty that's something that is worth preserving. It's a masterpiece. You and I both enjoy these great masterpieces, and we, you and I, I believe, have a, a, a responsibility to care for these masterpieces and to carefully and generously pass them on to future generations. So, thank you very much. How does your organization work with the Buffalo Parks District? I assume there's a public department of some sort that's responsible for the park system in order to oversee and guide the kinds of priorities they assign to capital projects and maintenance projects? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, we work very closely with the Parks Department. Uh, we manage about three quarters of the parkland in the city, and uh, the city then manages the other quarter. Um, they also, we meet with them on a very uh, regular basis to discuss uh, just kind of ongoing operations. Our director of operations meets with the city, um, sort of his counterparts at the city. Our architect meets with the buildings department to express our needs when it comes to buildings, repairs, and capital improvements. Uh, we've also, the deputy commissioner of parks sits on our design review committee and uh, we meet with him once a month. He and I meet once a month to discuss that agenda for that committee and to talk about projects and priorities. Um, I would, it, it, it's a difficult relationship. It isn't always easy 
uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I'd say one of the areas where we have the most challenges is in the area of uh, communications. Um, and we think we have stories that we need to tell the public through the media. And of course, the city is very um, protective of how those stories get pre uh, presented to the media. Um, but they're not very responsive. And so uh, if there's one area where sometimes I really tick them off, our friends at the city, it's in the area of communications. And uh, so I'm, I'm more and more aware of uh, when there's certain projects or areas where the city feels protective of the messaging, I'll refer the media to that, to the city and say, you must talk to them about that project. So, yes. Yes. I just wondered how you dealt with the a Dutch elm disease. I remember going back to Buffalo to visit when that had sort of devastated Lincoln Parkway and yeah. and it just I don't mean to bring up such a terrible subject, but no, it's I, it is awful. How awful of you to bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the well, like every major American city uh, across the country that could grow elm trees did uh, grow elm trees because they were a great tree. They grew fast. They grew strong. They grew beautiful, and then they all died. And uh, in Buffalo, they planted. Um, a cultivar of the Chinese elm called the Christine Waterman or Christine Buzman elm. We have, if you go to Wikipedia and look up Christine Buzman elm, it mentions the enormous planting of them in Buffalo. Oh, really? Yeah, and they're okay. They're not, you know, nothing like the original. And so, as they die, uh, we replace them with disease-resistant American elms, which are getting better and better. And uh, some do better than others, but uh, we're little by little getting back to um, more American elms again. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to eventually have quite a, a nice stand of them. But we will never plant exclusively one species ever again. Um, so we're very mindful of trying not to do that. We are right now losing all of our ash trees to the emerald ash borer. It's, uh, you know, another epidemic that can't be stopped. And uh, so we, we've raised some money through our Save Our Ashes campaign. <laughs> and, uh, and we're injecting uh, certain really critically important landscape trees with uh, an insecticide that stops the uh, insect from killing them. But it only works for a couple of years, and then you have to do it again, and then again, and again. So we're only going to be able to save about 5% of the ash trees in the park system. So, yes? Uh, I, I'm a member of the Volunteer Park Trust, which is an organization here in Seattle that's um, trying to do participate to be a model for public partner, uh, public-private partnership in re maintaining and enhancing our parks. And what I wondered is, from your experience, do you have specific strategies for how you seek to engage people, citizens, in actively participating in? in your organization, really becoming volunteers and helping with so many of the projects that you that you've have on, on the books for your park system in, in, in your city. Absolutely, yeah, that's a, boy, what a wonderful park, Volunteer Park is. It's just so beloved. You can tell that people just love being in such a beautiful place. Um, I think that your recent uh, planting project is a great model uh, where you took a landscape that was overgrown with invasive species and you replanted it using um, authentic plantings based on the Olmsted plan. And then you maintained it, watered it, and made sure that it got established in a good way. Uh, I believe that that is, is a very compelling way to get people uh, engaged because it's authentic, it's beautiful, and it's, a very, it's, a, it's something that's very tangible. You can see an overgrown, weedy mass transformed into something beautiful, historically appropriate, that greatly enhances a very popular landscape like that. So congratulations on, on such a great project. And I think that's probably, we find that um, our tree plantings are one of the most effective ways to get uh, volunteers involved. The folks in Buffalo love to plant trees. And uh, we, we plant a lot of trees every year with their help, both financial and with their actually coming out to help us get them in the ground. But then our, the conservancy, just like you guys, uh, then maintains that, those trees. We water them, we mulch them, we weed them, we prune them, we water, water, water for three years to get, make sure they get established. And um, I think that's an important model 
like you have uh, demonstrated in Volunteer Park, that um, when you do a landscape improvement like this, you don't just walk away, say, oh, good luck, landscape, hope you make it, <laughs> which they don't, unless you do uh, that extra five miles and make sure that they get watered, weeded, mulched, pruned, weeded, weeded, watered, watered, and so on. So, thank you. And, yes. Hi, um, we have a, uh, a Olmstead Boulevard and a green space, the Chiste uh, Boulevard and green space you may have visited, but it's, it is one of the more neglected assets in our Olmstead legacy. Happens to coincide with a new um, transit-oriented density town center. And uh, currently um, there's some discussion about how to make the best use of this underutilized and under, underserved resource. And uh, folks are talking about uh, implementing a plan for uh, mountain bike trails through it. And it's somewhat controversial, but you talked about recreation, and I'm wondering if you have some guidance on how we might um, properly blend the Olmstead vision with some of these newer recreational activities. Ah, boy, that's, yeah, that's a tough one, you know. Um, there are so many ideas about how to use our Olmstead landscapes that are really, in and of themselves, wonderful ideas. Um, uh, how many of you have heard of Andy Goldsworthy? Okay, oh, yeah. best sculptor in the planet, right? I had to call him up and say, yeah, Andy, no thanks, we don't want your sculpture in our park. Imagine, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. But Olmsted's landscapes are masterpieces in and of themselves. Say you were fortunate enough to have a Van Gogh. Granny left you the Van Gogh, isn't that nice? Would you allow a 21st century artist to come along and add a little bit of his or her interpretation to your Van Gogh? Heck no. You've got a Van Gogh here. You've got an Olmsted here. So do you allow 21st century people to come along and add this and that to your Van Gogh? I don't know. I think you need to think very carefully about that. Landscapes are living. Landscapes change over time. Olmsted knew that better than anybody. So can we lock the landscapes into 1868 in Buffalo or 1903 in Seattle? I don't know. But I think you've got to be very careful when you deviate from the original plans, the original designs, and start adding modern amenities because you may not have anything Olmsted left if you go down that parkway too far. So that's it. <laughs> Uh, yes. I'm, I'm really interested in the relationship between the Conservancy and the Parks Department. And uh, specifically, um, do you, how, how, do you, how, do, how do you work it out? Do uh, both groups work in the same landscape at times? Does the Parks Department do the mowing? Or how, how, is that, how does that whole system work? Yes, uh, so the way that we work with the city's Parks Department is more they provide advice and uh, occasionally get in the way of things. Um, but they do not do any of the day-to-day -day maintenance. We do all of the maintenance in the parks. So we have our own arborist team that does all of the arborist and forestry work. We do all of the mowing, all of the weeding, all the watering, all the mulching, and so on. Um, the city provides us with, um, they repair, they do major repairs for our uh, buildings and systems in our buildings. They'll provide uh, major repairs for equipment. Um, they have a, a plumber. We have one plumber in the city of Buffalo. His name is Nick. <laughs> Nick the plumber. We rely on Nick a lot. Um, we try to take good care of Nick because he could really do bad things if we don't. But it, it's so contractually, we're responsible for everything that happens in the parks. And uh, there's, uh, the city has a um, sort of mayor's hotline called, uh, that's 311 and people call when they have a complaint or they want to get something fixed. And then the city basically sends us those complaints to be addressed. And we have a sort of 24 hour uh, response time that we stick to. And that's a very helpful, it's very helpful for us actually to get that feedback all the time and hear from park users what the issues are. Sometimes they call us, they Facebook us, they email us, they yell at us, but it, it, the, commu the community provides us with a lot of feedback as well as the city. So in a sense, it's really like two parallel park systems. 
it is, in a way, two parallel park systems. It's a little hard on the city park uh, folks because they're not able to um, sustain the, the non-Olmstead parks at the levels that um, the Conservancy can sustain our parks at. And um, I've been a little concerned about having a two-class park system um, because there is the, the Olmstead parks that we take care of that are completely graffiti-free, completely um, well-maintained on a daily basis. The benefit, though, that I've seen is that the non-Olmstead parks have been getting more and more attention from the city because they don't want to have that stark contrast between the parks that we maintain and the parks that they maintain. So overall, I think it's turned out to be a good thing. So, little competition's a good thing, right? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Brooks Kolb. I'm former president of the Friends of Seattle's Homestead Parks. And in the last three years, Seattle has made some big strides because we've created the Volunteer Park Trust that another gentleman spoke about. And we also have a um, over arching organization that is more or less on paper, but hopefully will grow, called the Olmstead Trust. And then this fall, Seattle voters voted in favor of a metropolitan parks district. So this is all really Bravo. great, <laughs> uh, a really great um, shot in the arm for Seattle parks. But yeah. what I'm wondering about is, we've received a lot of small donations from individuals as we get started with our volunteer park trust. How do we take the next leap and get big corporate donations? And what are the types of corporate donations that you've found in Buffalo? And how, uh, how, is the corporation, how have the corporations interacted with the other parts of your fundraising efforts? Oh, that's a great question. A um, couple of things. Uh, we recently, well, I wouldn't say recently, a few years ago, we decided that the composition of the board needed to change. When I was hired about almost seven years ago, the board was a really solid, well, maybe I should be polite, B-plus board. And, uh, you know, there were wonderful people. Some of them were very well connected. Uh, a few of them were wealthy. And uh, we needed to change the composition uh, a bit to be able to reach to exactly that audience. And so we were very conscious about selecting people to add to our board that had a passion for the parks and access to corporate resources. Um, they then began to introduce me to some of those people. And then I would go out for drinks or, I hate to say it, but you know, a little bit of golf. And uh, I do have three golf courses. I have to go out and inspect them. <laughs> And uh, building relationships um, with corporate leaders then led to opportunities. Um, I got a call from the fellow who is the CFO at a major corporation that was, it still operates in Buffalo, it's owned by a Japanese company, and he says, we're getting ready to celebrate our 125th anniversary, do you have any ideas about what we could do? And I said, well, how about planting 125 trees in the park together? and make it a day, have your company come out, have uh, everyone plant the trees, and then have lunch, and then maybe do some team building. Loved the idea. Gave us $45,000 to do it. So it was a nice donation. Um, and the 125 trees are a legacy that they can point to. We planted those trees. And uh, we've had other corporations and other uh, insurance companies celebrating 150 years, uh, planted 150 trees. And, um, the way we've got the math lined up is that the 350 bucks per tree pays for the tree and its installation and three years of care. So it goes to our bottom line, helps build our, our sustainability, and enhances and, and uh, restores the Olmstead landscape patterns in the, in the park. Um, other things, of course, that we've done with corporations is we've planned, um, we have a relationship with HSBC Bank. Uh, they have a major presence in Buffalo, and uh, they've uh, given us a grant for around fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year, and they also provide thirty percent of our volunteer workforce every year. And they come out on they're they're released from work several days throughout the year, and they come out to one of our parks in particular that they've fallen in love with, and they work really hard in that park, 
really hard, and they've helped us to restore the original landscape patterns and, uh, and begin to restore uh, plantings. And some of the, the folks involved in this so fell in love with this, they said, you need more trees than you're planting, and they raised money themselves to plant trees out there. Um, so they, they also have the, you pay five bucks to wear jeans and sneakers on Fridays, and so they gave us $3,000. That's a lot of sneakers and jeans, isn't it? So that, but it's a relationship. Um, HSBC was closing their retail banking in Western New York. They sold it to another bank, and the, the day they were announcing it, their CEO flew in from Shanghai or wherever it is that they're based, and she wanted to have lunch with me, and I'm like going, wow, this is cool. And so there were six nonprofits that they had been supporting for a long time, and they said, look, we just wanted you to know that just because we're closing our, our retail banking, we're not going away, and we're still going to support you at the same level that we have been because we're so committed to what we're doing with you. And it's all based on their staff telling their bosses how much they love being a part of the parks. So, it's relationships. It's always about relationships, really, even at the highest level and also from the grassroots level. So I would say both of them come together in building corporate relationships that are meaningful and long, and long term. And when the relationships are built properly, they repeat year after year and it gets a little easier. Not always, but it gets easier. Um, some corporations are looking for um, specific benefits to tell their story through your nonprofit work, and that gets a little tricky. Um, you have to be very transparent with them about what they're going to get. If they're a sponsor for this gala, they get this, 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 and this. And then you try to give them a little bit more because uh, they're going to want it. And uh, that's, a, that's a tricky part, you know, that whole gala sponsorship thing. Um, and you have to have people on staff who really uh, are meticulous about um, under-promising and over-delivering when you're working with corporate sponsors like that. So I hope that's helpful. Great, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Been the, around that block a few times. <laughs> sure, one more question, anybody? Are you, question? Yes, please. Um, my question relates to um, uh, parks that perhaps have been have an Olmsted legacy, but that became um, either were never fully developed as an Olmsted park in the mm. early days, or have been degraded over time by different uses. Um, so my, my experience is uh, in working on planning for a park that was in that kind of a state uh, where we were able to get some new land because reservoirs were being covered and it opened up uh, new park space. And so even though we could not recreate the historic Olmsted landscape, we're, we, we did the planning in a way that um, you know, to, to bring in the philosophy of Olmstead. What, uh, but there's a lot of, t it seems like there's uh, always tension in um, not considering these to be, you know, fully Olmstead parks. Um, how do you, how do you, you know, I, I mean, I think that these parks need to have the same sort of protection and respect because they are um, embodying the Olmstead philosophy. How, how do you deal with that tension? Is the, do you have an example from Buffalo like Absolutely, that? Absolutely, sure. Um, I think that the more Olmstead, the better. And if you look at the impact of Olmstead parks on uh, quality of life and real estate, real estate values, building the tax base, um, they they have an almost magical impact on on those things. Uh, Central Park is perhaps the most extreme example of that in the nation, um, but. In Buffalo, uh, we, were, uh, we have this incredible structure. It's the old psychiatric hospital that was designed by H.H. H. Richardson. And uh, it is 600,000 square feet of abandoned, scary old building in the middle of a landscape that was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. And uh, we got $100 million allocated from the state to help begin to rehabilitate this property. Um, and what we did is we, I think that a really important first step that we took and that I recommend you do as well as a cultural landscape report where you, you really understand what is uh, remaining of the original design. Really uh, document, understand the existing conditions 
and begin to identify the opportunities for restoration or reinterpretation. So you're, you're beginning from a base of knowledge. And then we apply WWOD. What would Olmsted do? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we, we worked with Andrew Pogon out of Philadelphia. They came in and uh, we redesigned the landscape around this building. Uh, we're um, building, we've identified a, a hotel operator who's going to build a hotel, boutique hotel in this building. And uh, we restored the south lawn to as close as we could get it to the Olmsted principles. But we started with what was there originally. And then from there, we adapted the site to meet modern needs as well as, because it was now going to be a public landscape as opposed to a um, enclosed private hospital landscape. And uh, it, it's a landscape also that, because Andrew Pogon is one of the most ecologically oriented landscape firms around, uh, they incorporated uh, sustainable landscape practices, which we all believe Olmsted would have been at the cutting edge of if he were alive today. Um, so the, I encourage you all to come to Buffalo and see our new landscapes at the Richardson Complex, stay in the hotel, and come for a visit to Delaware Park and all the wonderful things that we have going on in Buffalo. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jennifer Ott. I'm the president of the Friends of Seattle's Olmsted Parks. And um, we are an advocacy group that works to increase awareness of um, Seattle's Olmsted Brothers Parks and Boulevard system, which we were fortunate enough to get in 1903 and 1908 when the Olmsted Brothers came to Seattle. And um, it's largely intact. And like the system in Buffalo, um, John Charles Olmsted um, developed something that includes the whole city and connects it with boulevards and takes advantage of the natural environment here. And so um, we're excited to see what's going on in Buffalo because it offers us an opportunity to see how another city takes advantage of the assets that they have that are historic. And um, landscape preservation is a very difficult um, subject to tackle. And so it's um, very exciting to see what they've been doing there and to see how we can do it here. So one of the things that you're going to hear tonight is about the National Association of Olmsted Parks, which is a a national organization, a coalition of, of groups from around the country that uh, have an Olmsted legacy they're trying to preserve and maintain. But in 1980, there was a crisis in Buffalo and they invited cities from around the country and Seattle was one of those cities that participated in a conference that resulted in the creation of this national association, which is uh, continues to this day. And Chris Bailey is the current uh, co-chairman of the national, or actually chairman, right? Uh, of the, yeah. So why don't you talk about today? Uh, thanks, thanks, Don. And Don and I have also been involved in the Dunn Gardens in the north part of Seattle, which is another Olmsted landscape that has been preserved and now is open to the public. So all over the country there are Olmsted landscapes, there are what we call Olmstedians, all these people here who uh, spend a lot of time uh, learning about and learning how to preserve these landscapes. And many of them are public parks, like all over Seattle, or boulevards. Some are private landscapes. And so what NAOP, which is the National Association, tries to do is link all these active groups together. Because everywhere in the United States are Olmsted landscapes and people who work very hard to preserve them, to make sure they're not threatened, and to uh, carry out what Frederick Law Olmsted and his two sons, John Charles and F.L.O. Jr., would have wanted to happen long after they are gone. So that's what this is about. We're going to hear from Thomas, who runs the system in Buffalo, which is a public-private enterprise. Lots of lessons there. That, that city and Seattle are the two cities in the country that have the most intact plans carried out by the city parks people uh, to be citywide. They're very different, but you'll hear about, um, about Buffalo and and what we're doing here in Volunteer Park and other places uh, is going to carry out a restoration of what the original Olmsted plans were. So that's why this is important. And Seattle, of course, is recognized as having one of the best preserved Olmsted Park system outside of New York and Boston. So we're pretty proud of what we've got and just need an effort to continue to maintain it and keep it viable.
Um, I'm Betsy Curran. I'm with Seattle Parks Foundation, and we're really pleased to be a presenter of this tonight. Um, Olmstead is so important to our city, um, and we work on behalf of all the parks in Seattle. We advocate for public space, and we help raise private dollars and also influence public dollars coming into pro projects led by community um, leaders. So I'm honored to be here, and um, we champion Olmstead. We, we refer to his plan his plan from uh, over 100 years ago all the time as a staff and as board members. And um, I'll be pleased to hear what Thomas has to say tonight. Thanks. Hi, I'm Doug Bailey, the chairman of the Volunteer Park Trust and a director of the Friends of Seattle's Olmstead Parks. We're so excited. This evening we're having an event. A speaker, Thomas Mischler, Harara Mischler from Buffalo, New York, talking about the Buffalo Park Department and the great success they've had in renovating their Olmstead Park system. This is a joint venture by the Volunteer Park Trust and the Friends of Seattle's Olmstead Parks who are working with the Seattle Park Foundation to renovate our park system and we have many lessons to learn from Thomas's experience in New York. Uh, this is a town hall. We're having a great turnout. Uh, the Volunteer Park's mission is to restore Volunteer Park, and then we have aims to continue this into the rest of Seattle's Olmstead Parks and educate the people of the Olmstead legacy. The Seattle Friends of the Friends of Seattle's Olmstead Parks has been in business in Seattle for 20, 25 years, and has done a fabulous job of preserving the features of our Olmstead Parks and dealing with all of the issues of development in Seattle 520 and the other issues in a very quiet and professional way. I'm happy everybody's here and it's going to be a great talk.